and I is the same. And I need to come back to it in order to ground my point yesterday more precisely. You know where it says, you shall have no other God beside me. The Hebrew phrase is capable of being translated in any of three ways. Either you shall have no other God besides me, before me, or beyond me. And it is important that we nuance that when we begin to talk about the exclusiveness of the one we worship or the priority of focusing on the one true God in our worship. So that when we worship, we do not find ways to bring in others. You know, you heard people praying and in the middle of their prayer, they stop and start addressing the devil. You know, the devil is a liar. It's all well meaning. But in worship, it is for God alone. And nobody besides God is part of the conversation. And nobody before God. That is to say, there is no priority. There is no subsidiary activity that needs to be done in order to worship God. There is none before Him. This is why we come just as we are. You can't make yourself great of God. You come to God and God bids you come. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. So that there is no preparatory thing. There is no right you must fulfill. And this is said from in the Old Testament when the notion of having a prepared lamb was there. But the Old Testament anticipates the New Testament where the lamb is already prepared. The sacrifice is already made. There is a new and living way open to, to the veil of his flesh. So we come in worship with none before him, none as a stepping stone. And there is none beyond it. And that's key. Worship is never a means to an end. You never worship God because you want to set up yourself. Because you want the blessing. Because we are turning blessing into an idol these days. There is nothing beyond it. He is the end point. He is the goal. Worship is an end in itself. I wanted to make those subsidiary points yesterday. I remember that we framed it to say that the outcome, the intended consequence of worship is the building up of the church. And by that we meant the centering, the challenging, and the calling of the church. That the church defines itself by that it worship, who it worship, and what worship means to the church. And you notice I have avoided saying how we worship. I remember sitting in a, um, one of those things where you bring in new members and one of these gentlemen who was sharing his testimony said that when he was passing he looked over the church and said that is another quiet spot which is another way of describing a graveyard. So it's quiet. Um, and meaning that this was not a noisy church. And I'm going to have some words to say about that a little later on. But how is not important because it is idiosyncratic. It is up to you and up to me. It is that we worship and who we worship and what worship means when we worship. So we argue that it is the building up centering and then the challenging, the broadening of the horizon so that the consciousness is raised, the options are many and multiplied, and it is the calling of the church into service of the human family that are the intended consequences of worship, the outcome, a built-up church, and a church that just worship is 
day. Isn't solid, isn't grounded, isn't rooted, isn't centered. Today we come to make the mark, make the remark that worship is for others. We worship so that the unbeliever may see, may come to know and to know. So it is not just the unbeliever though. The worship is always a, an activity taken on behalf of my neighbor. That's why intercession is an important part of worship. It is always with the others in mind. Not just me and my kind. The excluded others. The others who we think are unqualified to come. This is clearly what is behind the discussion that Paul is having with this overgifted church. That they are interested in parading their gifts and use their gifts to its optimum. But they were not mindful of how the cacophony of sounds, the noise they were making, the things they were doing, how it bared, how it impacted, of what use it was to others, including people who didn't understand it and people who not believe it. So I want to suggest that one of the ways in which worship develops is minded by the need of my neighbor, the other, the excluded, the unbeliever. Always. They must be part of the conversation, part of the thinking, and part of the outcome. If the other is in mind, we have to start at the very beginning to acknowledge that worship is necessarily a work of the Holy Spirit. Worship is necessarily not a human contrivance, not a set of clever things that we do, but worship is the outcome of the doings of God the Holy Spirit upon our lives. And there is a key verse that arranges argument in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. In 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, he brings in the discussion of the, the gifts that the church were exercising, the church was exercising at Corinth. And so chapter 12, we talked about the gifts, you remember, you know, talked about different gifts, yeah. little gifts and big gifts. And then chapter 13, he talks about the more excellent way of love. And chapter 14, he returns now to the problem of his order and worship which has become chaotic by people just doing their own thing, making it a free for all. This is what is being discussed in chapter 14. But at the very outset, of his discussion, he asserts something which, if you are a person who marks your Bible, deserves to be underlined. Chapter 12, verse 2. He says, No one speaking by the Holy Spirit can say that Jesus is Christ. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Again, you are crazy in the New Testament. John puts it differently. John includes the possession of the Spirit in the ministry of Jesus. Whereas the other gospel writer puts the Spirit as the second step, the other comforter. John includes it. And in chapter 7, he shows Jesus as going to the late great day of the feast, the final day, and the feast of tabernacle was a ritual for farming and the last day was a prayer for rain and they would pour out the water and when they did that Jesus stood remember it said that at last we their face and said if any man thirsts let him come unto me 
and drink. And as the scripture says, out of his belly, out of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. And then it says, this spake he of the Holy Spirit who was not yet given because Jesus was not yet exalted. So there is a, a there is a, a, a reciprocal relationship between spirit and Lord. Without the enthronement of Jesus as Lord, there is no spirit. And without the spirit, there is no lordship of Jesus Christ. So what we are here accepting is that for worship to be worshipped, it is by the Holy Spirit. Now I know you know the earlier chapter read for you. The true worshippers worship in spirit. It's an it's an apex genetic That is the truth. So the word and the spirit are the two sides of the one kind. The word is the instrument of the spirit, and it is by the spirit that the word is uh, takes flesh and is clear in our so. Worship is an exercise in the spirit. Worship is an, ex an activity of the spirit. And worship is worship in the power of the spirit. And it is because of the Holy Spirit that our worship can have an impact not just on ourselves, but on others, including the excluded and the unbelieving and the unqualified. They can be brought in through the power of the Spirit. And I'm going to say two sets of two things in relation to that outcome. One is to define for us what are the ways in which the Spirit makes himself evident in our worship. Spirit. 
and had a moment of ecstasy and they asked, remember the question, he saw also among the prophets. But as we know, he is indicted by the most dreadful indictment of all to obey his better and sacrifice and to have another fact of life. So the Holy Spirit gives us an encounter with himself. That encounter does not necessarily always include, but very often does include a sense of a moment of ecstasy, a moment with God where clearly it is a life transformed moment. When he calls your name, when he touches you again, there is this. And some of us, you know, have to be touched more than once. We have to keep going back to get a touch or another touch. You know that the story of Peter confessing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the Living God, is preceded in Mark's Gospel with the blind man whom Jesus had to put mud on his eyes and wash him and then touch him again. Right? And you see that played out in Peter's life. The, the miracle is intended to anticipate the problem because Peter confessed Jesus freely, but afterwards Jesus had to send him to get the guy and the And it's like us, you know, we have to come back to the altar. So that Paul says that I beseech you ready by the mercy of God that you present your bodies living in sacrifice. And they say the problem with living sacrifices that they will crawl out the altar. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit both is the source of a renewing encounter and the source of an equipping encounter. It is to clarify what are the ethical permutations, what are the outcomes, how it is that we decide, how it is that we act. That is the great movement of the state. Everything else can be used not the ethic of love. That is the authenticating sign. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. You know the story of Peter. As he has himself been empowered by the spirit of Pentecost, and he had his Pentecost. But when he now tried to live in the community, he felt that I'm gonna be with tomorrow the ways in which our prejudices survive the born again experience. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. Because that was a superficial conviction that we have that constitutes the change. The deeply rooted things, prejudices, which are not yet part of the conversation, have to be challenged and rooted out by the Spirit. Because Peter's example, you remember, that Peter, and he had this more than once, He's a Jew. He goes when God is preparing him to go and witness to Cornelius. And he's at um, Simon's house in Judea. And he has a bit and he's hungry too. And he's, you know, the Persian says, Rise, Peter, kill him. And he said, Not so, Lord. Never eaten anything common on earth. But God knew he was going to take a journey to, go to Cornelius' house. And he was going to eat them hungry. But his religion would not allow him. So this was part of the preparation, and he said, what? Not so, Lord. And I keep saying, that is, I am not so, our Lord, you can't go. If it is Lord, it is. But if it is not so, it is not Lord. He said, not so, Lord. Because these are not things that he was prepared to have challenged. These are not values that he's prepared to question. And even though he had that experience there, when later in his ministry, this time he's a senior citizen. He goes to Galatia, the church of Galatia. And the Judaizers came down, some people knew. 
and they put a little pressure on him to eat out at their house only. And not to the Gentiles. And create a division within the church. Paul said, I will to the, to the face. It's almost another facing man to buy your Paul is keeping brother. Because I'm mad about it. And he said, Lord Peter. He said, I will put him to the face. And what you see here is that the real project of worship is the exercise of the spirit deepening the understanding which arises from in such a way that we can live it out in the world, not in some cockroom that we create, not in some religious language value behind which we hide, but in the cut and thrust of human experience. This is what it is about. And worship is the place where we make ourselves ready to lead the people who you don't want to lead it, including your co or your neighbor. That is where it is sorted out. And if worship doesn't prepare us, function better in the human community, not among our likes and our friends yeah. and the people who invite us to them, but amongst others. Mm -hmm. Then it is of no consequence and this is why the church is lost and horrible. No. Because what we are doing is organizing ourselves in social contours. If you want to see a worship service, make a madman come to the church. I see the people of Sardar come to the church to get rid of them. That's what we do. Because we're not ready to deal with it. We have no space for it. Right? People come to us and tell us they're broke and hungry. And we say, what is the government doing, man? The economy is collapsing. <laughs> but it's not us. It's not us. We are building cocoon safe zones for ourselves. Yeah. And in this little discussion, Paul said, you're going out of your tongue stick. What it for? What it for? Yes, you can sound good. But who are you talking to? Who are you helping? And he says, I would rather speak five intelligible words than a thousand or ten thousand. We must be minded by the community in which we are. We must be minded by the ways in which people are being pushed to the edges. And worship is our preparation. Worship is the kind of thing which will make them begin to consider options. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, clearly if you read this passage that Paul has in mind, Pentecost, the narrative about Pentecost. Because that is his reference when he's talking about tongues. Because when they spoke in tongues on the day of Pentecost, there were no wasting words. There was no other of Right? The, the words meant something to the people listening. You remember? Yeah. How is it that we hear them speaking? Not just in our French, but in our Creole. Not just in our English, but in our pattern. In our native tongue. Speaking the things of God. So that is Paul. So in order to see what the outcome of worship is, let's go back to Acts chapter 2, just remind us that there are two basic questions that when we worship and people become exposed to the mystery of God, to the power of God, to the grace of God, to the word of God, to the potential of God's spirit transforming their life, two questions are prompted. Let's look at Acts chapter First question, Acts chapter 2, verse 30. They have seen and heard. Let me kind of give you the context. Starting at verse 7. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Who is it that you hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Edomites, residents of Mesopotamia, 
Phrygia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And they are amazed, and they and were all, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? So, in the power of the Spirit, worship must confront people with the mystery of God. Ask me why. You don't ask me why I can tell you why. I sat down from last week and wrote the order of service. I honestly believe that God deserves more than our random people. Even with giving the person the thing for them to do, they know you read it before they come. It is a weakness that we have. It is a weakness that we have. We take God for granted. Yes, sir. We come to worship people here without thought, without thinking, without nuance. Not merely that we didn't come and say our three hallelujahs or something like that, but really that we haven't put our minds in. We are dealing with an immense God. A transcendent, a holy other, a God who is greater. I get the chance to go to official functions. And I hear people like to get in the church and, and pretend that they are in things and get about all protocols observed. In the places that I go, you can't simply say all protocols observed. You have to call them their names in order. And if you get the order wrong, you offend them. They them have to walk out. As happened in Grenada the day before yesterday, when the Chinese ambassador walked out on the Grenada and Luna Minister, he got the protocol wrong. This is just the first thing. You didn't really the God of God. And sometimes we forget that there are stories in which people died by getting it wrong. They worship Cain got it wrong. Kill his brother, he never died, but he killed his brother. Use a lot of brother. And a nice and survive. So when you come into the awesome presence of God, you can't be flippant. What they want to say? You can't be pedestrian. In the old Anglican sanctuaries, they used to have a first door and a second door. And they still do in North America. Well, okay, they can't put them in the <laughs> and the idea is that when you come off the street and you go to the first one, you have to know kind of you like you gather your stick to go to the second one. Because when you go to the second one, you're in the sanctuary. You're in the luminous. You're in the presence of God. And that's why they still have stained glass with them. They don't let the light in as well. Because they feel the candles going on the sun. So, you know, the people have gone out of the country, even children sit down here, they don't run up and down. So, what do we think of the children? We know all the people from the camp around the town. Well, they don't want to come to the church. Worship has to confront people with the immensity and mystery of God so that they say, What does this mean? But and our society has become iconoclastic and irreverent. Anybody is anybody. And part of the reason why stories of the misbehavior are not of ministers take such currency in our life is because it is in keeping with the tearing down of standards. So anything goes. And everything I have to We don't <coughs> buy that. Worship sets this about. You know how carefully this was contrived in the minds of Israel as they developed the concept of the holiest of all, to which you entered once per year. And when you enter, you have to have a pay. 
Kenapa enggak ada tempat menurut? Minggu ini saya tidak tahu ini ada bisa mengerti. It was not very expression of this word. So the first question is what is this? Don't be afraid to keep the things which sets our faith apart as not a thief or not. Not a ending goal. The second question is in verse 37. What shall we do? The worship must just, not just come from persons with the mystery of God, but also with the claims of God upon their lives. We must set apart chances. That's why these modern developments in which the church has become another part of the secular agenda of upward move of social mobility and God is your password to get your piece of the path. It is such a people need to be confronted with choices, with the claims of God upon them. Don't believe that this is about how to win friends and win friends. How to go along to get along. Don't let people believe they are all right when they are not. When you read the Old Testament and meet false prophets, they are always full of good news. They are always full of promises because their popularity is everything to them. The true prophet was prepared to bear the uncomfortable truth to the king and to kingdom. That time must not be lost. Don't get people in the idea that this is light entertainment. We are there to tickle their fancy and keep them happy. That's not what worship is. Worship is our Responding gratefully to the doings of God in the power of the Spirit for the sake of others. Not for our sake. Not even for God's sake. But God don't need our way. But for their sake. The loss. The liberty. Desperate. The experience. Confront them throughout both with the mystery of God and with the claims of God. In the worship of the established church, the altar is the center. In the worship of our churches, the Bible and the pulpit are the same. It shouldn't be one or the other. It shouldn't be either the ethical clear or the undeniable encounter. It's more than that. So by our worship, we must carefully include, engage, expose ourselves to the power of the Spirit to bring God's grace and God's power to bear upon our life. That's what it is. But equally and diligently, we must allow the word of God to be fully available to the power of God. That is the same. Tomorrow we are going to be with the most difficult of our question. All things must be done decently and in order. I was told by two very eloquent and kind members of the community who bothered to speak with me afterwards. You know, you do these things and people don't know the importance of writing your note 
of saying this night or this year of I found that it could be improved upon. But it is a vital task, but if you are not entertained here, I am not here for light entertainment. I am here to engage you. So your feedback, not your approval, your feedback is a part of the dialogue. But some of those who spoke to me resisted the idea of, of a structured service. They said they felt that they were elsewhere. And that's all right. You will not, today is Roman Catholic, yesterday was Anglican, and today is Catholic. But what we really are asking is that the service is about the government of our course. Yes. So I don't care if all three sons are in a flat and that they have the right pitch. No matter if they like them or not. You see this song that most of you didn't know? One of the great hymns of the revival. Now I to say that to ask you because it just is not in the spirit of God descend upon my heart. We need from earth to all its pulses move, stoop to thy weakness, mighty as thou art, and help me love thee as I ought to love. I ask no dream, no profit ecstasies, no sudden rending of this day of day, no angel visitant, no opening skies, just to live. The business of my soul I teach you to love me as thy angel of one holy passion, feeling all my faith, the baptism of the heaven descended of God, my heart and my heart, and my love. But it is hard to put that song to me. And we must feel free to be bogged down in the nuances of spiritual experience as we go to worship. We're we not doing this for us, we're doing it for others. Others who take life for granted, who think that this is an automatic, that it designed itself and created it. And therefore, they don't have to be engaged. You put the time. You put the life in. You put the world in. So that they will be confronted by the mystery of God.